Danny Johnson interviews Jesus and Mary about the summary of Brazil trip. The interview took place in Brasilia, Goes, Brazil, on the 17th of August 2012. I'm Denny Johnson, and I'm here with AJ and Mary. We're in Brasilia on August 16th, and this the uh, last couple of days of your visit to Brazil. And maybe we could summarize a bit of the questions that have come up as a result of your visit, and probably the one that has come up most often uh, for people who haven't really had the courage to ask you directly, is many of them came wanting to be convinced or to prove it to themselves that you're not or you are Jesus and Mary, yeah. right? And they, some of them were disappointed that you don't look the role or you don't project more love or maybe you're not wearing the right robe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Could you address this? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, I firstly find it interesting that people have a lot of questions, but because they feel the questions might be offensive, they do not ask them directly. Um, whereas I, myself and Mary both would prefer that people actually ask questions directly. They don't need to ask them with anger or resentment or other types of emotions, but they can certainly ask, ask their direct questions in a direct manner, and we'd be very, very happy to answer them. But in regard to this particular question, um, yes, I feel there are just so many expectations that people have. Often the expectations are completely contrary to each other as well, ironically. So, you know, any person who walks this earth with a white robe with long hair, he might be taken to be Jesus more than I am. And when I dress uh, as a normal uh, guy, who, uh, uh, and An particularly a normal Aussie guy, um, they, uh, they of course can't accept that. And sometimes when I'm presenting... I have bare feet and, and shorts and a t-shirt and, and many people can't accept that. In addition, I feel many people expect me to perform some kind of miracle in order to uh, prove to them uh, 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 my identity. And this comes from many misunderstandings about what happened in the first century, what was recorded. If people look sincerely at the Bible, they will see that it wasn't until I was baptised that I began actually performing miracles. And the reason for this was it wasn't until I was baptised that I became at one with God. Now, I have said to people that I'm going through a process this time while we're on earth, and Mary is going through a similar process as well. And it will not be until we're at one with God that these so-called miracles and other things can actually be performed. And to be frank, I do not want to perform them until that time either. Because until that time, I'm not in complete harmony with how God would do things. And for that reason, I will not be performing miracles and I will not uh, try to gain people's respect or approval through the performance of special deeds just to prove to them who I am. Also, I feel uh, many people cannot see love but they can easily feel addiction. So when people go along to gurus around the world, they often expect the guru to give them a feeling of love. And the reality is that these gurus are willing to do that because the spirits with them are willing to do it. So all of these gurus are overcloaked by a spirit or group of spirits. And then whenever the person is open to feeling their sensation of what they believe is love, then, then the spirits project through the guru generally, but also sometimes separately to the guru, a feeling of love to that person. And then they go, oh, this is a wonderful experience. I definitely believe him. But it was just a spirit-induced experience that had no semblance or, or no discussion about truth and no connection with reality. And in reality, we're teaching people about how to connect with God for themselves and have an experience of God's love for themselves. And no other person can initiate that for another person. We can only give the teachings and then allow people to make that connection for themselves. It, it will never be our role to give other people God's love. And, um, and it's many impossible people have for us to do it. Yeah, they have that expectation that they should yeah. either experience extreme love 
what they, as you say, what they classify as love or experience God by being in our company when really God has designed that relationship to be very personal and based on a person's own sincere desire. So, Hmm. yeah. And ironically, many of the uh, times these people are interpreting a projection of love, the reality is that a lot of times it's not actually love being projected at the person but rather an addictive emotion to fulfil a specific need inside of the person. And many times it contains sexual feelings coming from spirits to people that make them believe that it's love. And and we feel these kind of projections are very damaging to both the spirit and the person who is involved. So uh, the reality is, if a person cannot see that I'm speaking the truth to them, and they cannot see that I'm always loving in the manner that I deal with them. I don't get angry with them or upset with them or bitter with them, even when they are condescending and angry and bitter with me, then they are not able to see love in action. And if they're not able to see love in action, then it's going to be very difficult for them to determine our identity. And I feel another reason, uh, another thing is that people do have this expectation that I perform some kind of miracle for them just for the point of proving something to them. Even when I am at one with God, I will not be performing miracles just to prove things to people. In fact, if I had that attitude, I would never be able to perform miracles that come from God. The reality is that every desire you have with God has to be pure in order to be, in, in order to be engaged. And this means that if I have a pure desire to, to help a person and they have a pure desire to connect to God, I can certainly assist them and, and once I'm at one with God, will do so many times. But if a person is not pure in their desire for God and not pure in their desire to see a miracle, they will see none, just as all the peop- many people in the first century who, who came to listen to me never saw a miracle. And the reason why is because they had the same attitude that many people today have. And that attitude is one of, like, perform the miracle, then we'll believe. And I'm saying, no, if you can't believe the things that I'm saying to you through your own personal experience, and you can't see the logic and the truth in what is being presented, then you've already got a problem, really, and you need to become a lot more open if you can't, if you can't examine these things more truthfully. And you also need to look at your own attitude. If your attitude is one, prove to me, prove to me, prove to me, all it proves is that you have a lot of mistrust of people and a lot of mistrust of an open person. And this, uh, this is an emotion that would need to be addressed at some point in the future. So I recommend to those people that rather than coming along to a seminar just to prove to themselves or disprove that I am Jesus, They'd be better, better off coming along to a seminar or, or a presentation to listen to the information and ask themselves, what is the value of this information? I've heard you say um, that you can ask God for proof that he's God. So is it, there's some way to present information to guide people to their relationship to God where they can feel the divine love for the first time and have that personal experience? Well, yes, usually anyone who uh, desires, has a pure desire for God's love in the first instance will go through a fairly large, usually very overwhelming and intense emotional experience receiving that love if they allow the emotional experience. The problem is, uh, for most people on earth, is they ask God things in the same manner that they ask me or other people things, and that is... They want the other people to prove something to them before they engage their desire. And God doesn't work that way. God waits for the desire to be pure before the experience can be had. And, and if a person is not experiencing something from God, even though they are asking, then that's because their own desire is not pure and their own desire for love and truth is not pure. Yeah, yeah and for me, that experience with God has it must require me being humble to really yielding to God's definition of love uh, and God's definition of God. Uh, For myself, even now, there's so many definitions that I have of um, how I want God to relate to me and who I think in my heart, who I really believe God to be. And it's not God's definition of God. And so if I'm, if I'm ever going to actually achieve a connection, that love connection with God, it requires the humility within myself to yield to 
his de- to want to know from him, who are you? What does your love feel like? Um, and that's an emotional place inside of me. And often fear or anger or a sense of um, loss or my lack of humility to loss prevents me yielding in that way. And, and I guess that's the key thing I always come back to, that I have to be willing to yield to God's definition of God and God's definition of love emotionally inside of me before I'm going to experience him. So, so when a lot of people come to the seminars and they're wanting us to give some kind of outward proof that we are who we say we are, my feelings about that now are, well, over a period of time you will soon see the truth about that particular issue. If you could listen a little bit more sincerely to what's being presented, you would actually be able to have a lot more... Uh, cognizance of of the truth being heard than if you than if you didn't well in fact you could have this experience of god's love couldn't you and, and you that could, yeah. should surpass a lot of things <laughs> yeah. about who we are yeah. what do you say to those people who had the doubts about chico xavier right? like there was not the code and I mean, this seems so petty it's like wait, wait they didn't have the code so it couldn't have been chico so they're not real Right. Yeah. This, uh, so this is in reference to when Mary on the first uh, Sunday of our visit um, channeled Chico Xavier asking questions about the spirit world and also about relationships on earth and reincarnation. And, uh, and we had this great interaction on that, sat- on that Sunday that people can listen to. Um, but yes, many people you could feel in the audience go, well, this can't be Chico Xavier for a number of reasons. The first reason is that he obviously was stating different beliefs than what he had when he was on earth. The second reason was that he was meant to have given a code of some kind and, uh, and this code would have validated who he was coming from the spirit world. Obviously, uh, probably Mary's the best person to answer some of those questions, but, but I can add to it after Mary has. Sure. Well, I mean, I didn't know anything about a code. I, to be honest, I didn't know anything about Chico <laughs> <Nor did> I. <laughs> before um, he was mentioned in conversation and suddenly he was this man with me wanting to speak. And um, the way I conduct mediumship is very much on a feeling basis. I don't hear words. I feel very strongly what this person wants to say. And when I went back to Chico upon hearing about the code, I went... What gives, you know? What's, what's all this about? And he said, well, firstly, for a start, he wasn't interested in proving to me who he was. He knew I could feel who he was, so any kind of code wasn't even necessary for him in that state. But also he said that he's quite jaded or um, tired of this issue of a code because it has been misused by so many other spirits. So many other spirits use a so-called code, in, and it's his, not his always. Code, code. It's, <laughs> but he said it's not even always the same code. He, there's just a code now that some code is all, almost has nothing to do with him, but it's been generated by other spirits to to perpetuate this idea that Chico, because obviously he has such a name and such respect here in Brazil, they want to perpetuate this idea that they are Chico even when they're not. Mm. So. Um, and I feel it's a, it demonstrates that people's on earth gross misunderstanding of the spirit world, actually. Because the reality is that any person who is in spirit form can listen to any other person in spirit form transmitting messages to people on earth. That being the case, they can hear any code that is delivered the very first time it is delivered. And then, of course, if they were malicious, they could choose to misuse that code at any time in the future. Any person who's a spirit knows this. And so th- this whole idea of giving a particular code is such a ludicrous idea that most people, when they pass, regret even stating that, that they would do that when they're on earth if they did state it, and because they understand in the spirit world that it's far different than what they expected and that anybody can examine anything that is said and listen to anything that is said and therefore can repeat anything that is said to another person. And I think also it demonstrates the the limitations there are on mediumship when... Uh, yeah. 
it's hard because I can't hear it. Yeah. Right? Um, the limitations there are on mediumship when a medium themselves is not engaged in connecting with themselves and their own soul. Mm. Because it's, for example, if I send you an email, you're just reading some words or hearing some words and there's not, unless there's some soul connection, some awakening within yourself of your feelings that you might feel something from me all you have are the words that i'm giving you and many mediums operate in this way they're not really connected with themselves they're not connected in feeling themselves and because when we connect to ourselves and feeling ourselves we're suddenly very aware of the feelings in others and so as a medium if i'm disconnected from myself in terms of my feeling and my growth all i have is the words and images that spirits present to me and I have no other way of discerning their, their character, their development in love themselves. As soon as I, as a medium, begin to engage in knowing myself, understanding my emotions, my own character, my flaws, and trying to heal those and develop in love, immediately I have much more of a sense of the emotions of not only people around me on earth, but of the people who come to me in spirit. Mm. It's just as we present a facade here on earth to others around us, it is relatively easy for a spirit to present a facade to a medium, mm. to present themselves as a, a white shining being and, and um, to speak words that they've heard in other locations in order to gain some level of trust with this person and develop a, a relationship with them. But if we, if we can really feel, we're, gonna, we're not going to... We might even be presented with the vision, but we'll feel, hang on, that's not really the, the development of that spirit. I can feel something else going on. And immediately we become much better as mediums. And I feel that for myself. Like I still feel I'm, I've got a long way to go in terms of my mediumship simply because I have a long way to go in terms of my own development. But I do know the more connected I am with myself emotionally, the, be the much clearer my mediumship is. And there are many people today who believe they're channeling celestial spirits, but they can't feel love and they can't because they're blocked to it because of their own unworthiness or other emotional issues. They're not developed in love themselves. They're not honest with their own emotions. And so, so how can they even know whether they're channeling what kind of, you know, what kind of spirit they're channeling? And the reality is when you see the spirits that are being channeled, Many times these spirits are in the hells or earthbound on the, on the earth. They're in a dark condition and all they're doing is reading the person's mind as to what the person wants to hear from the spirit and then just replaying that back to the person. And because the person's in a state of addiction, of course they go, yes, yeah, this is, in, this is amazing information because they are in complete agreement to, to, to the fact that they're channeling Jesus and they're channeling, and they're channeling this wonderful information which often has no substance whatsoever and no content whatsoever or is just the repeating of information that is already in their own mind or already in the public domain. And uh, we feel when we look at a lot of channeling that we see, we feel a lot of insincere people on earth channeling insincere spirits in the spirit world through their law of attraction, these two groups of people come together and they gain a lot of power and influence over people on earth, but unfortunately none of it is the truth. And this is the big problem. Two themes seem to prevail throughout our visit. Spirit influence and reincarnation. Mm -hmm. The um, spiritist religions are, are quite dominant here and what has affected even my feeling is that the the nature of the influence that these religions have over the lives of people involving spirits, but where the common person doesn't really have any idea the magnitude of the, the spirit influence that all of us are subjected to all the time. Mm -hmm. How do you answer this? Well, as we saw during our visit, um, when we spoke to some spirits who were classified themselves as healing spirits the other night mm -hmm. here in Brasilia, you remember the interaction that we had with them, those spirits said sometimes they remove 30 or 40 spirits from a person before, and then the person is healed, their body is healed, seemingly, and, and the spirits are just moved on. 
And uh, we see a lot of these kind of interactions happening around the world, and particularly in places like Brazil, where you know there is a much more openness to spirit interaction and spirit spirit-based healings. The the reality is that these spirits are just masquerading again as people who are uh, beneficial to people on Earth, but the reality is they are they are teaching things that are false because they themselves don't even know the truth yet. And all they're doing is they're spouting untruth that they believe as truth to people on the earth who then imbibe these untruths and then think that that is the truth because of the connection they have with the spirit. It's the, it's the unhealed addiction, addictions emo, based emotions that are in the person on earth that leaves them open to these kind of influences. And in particular, we are addicted to a number of things. We are addicted to being approved of. We are addicted to ha feeling powerful. We are addicted to feeling like we're not alone. We are addicted to many other emotions. And if you look at the opposite, we have grief within us that we're not powerful. We have grief within us that we're alone. And all of these underlying grieves are what produces all of these addictions. And these addictions then encourage spirits who are also in an addiction themselves to come to us masquerade as somebody who's important or someone who's, uh, uh, you know, who we believe is important or somebody who is full of information and then the people on earth believe this information because they want to without, without further investigation. And hopefully what we've demonstrated this visit is that once you start really talking to the spirits like Mary did with Shiko and, and we did with, with the groups of spirits who were healers and other groups of spirits, and you start actually speaking with these spirits, you find out that they are actually, they, they have no idea a lot of the times what they're even, whether what they're even saying to people on earth is true. And hopefully we've provided some explanation to people who have had very strong kind of experiences that they believe to be a past life experience. That, may, that perhaps that experience is actually an experience with a spirit who's trying to communicate with them or trying to have them believe in reincarnation or try to exert their influence over them. Hmm. Yeah. As, as you Just know, you've had many of those experiences. Yes, right? yes. Hmm. Yeah. So it seems like, um, boy, the, the, the primary theme I, I, I believe I picked up from you in this is that, that humility combined with you know, the repentance and, and the forgiveness, that well, if you might, I think of almost like a triangle, that humil without that humility to be willing to change completely and the trust in God, I mean... How else will we ever pass through the eye of the needle? Mm -hmm. I mean, it mm -hmm. seems like that one place is the place we need to be most. Yes, yeah, so, so like it is a narrow path that God has uh, created for us to connect to God, and for, on good for good reason. It's a narrow path because it need we need to become very refined in love in order to eventually become at one with God. And so I feel like the talks that we gave, that, that first talk that we gave in Sao Paulo about repentance and forgiveness and the mm -hmm. importance of uh, repentance and forgiveness in comparison to the law of compensation which deals with the unwilling soul. Um, getting, our soul getting ourselves to become willing, a willing participant in looking at ourselves and looking at our own unloving behaviour is a key part of our own personal change but it's also a key part of changing the world. Without examining our own unloving behaviour, we will never be able to see the unloving behaviour in the world either properly. And we will never be able to change it. If we do not change our own unloving behaviour, how can we expect other people who are unloving to change theirs? So um, I feel that information that was presented is probably, probably some of the most important information we presented while we were here yes. in Brazil. So we talked about the truth about God, and I feel uh, many people here in Brazil are quite open to the truth about God in the sense that they are, um, you know, they see God as an entity or, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just a force of some kind. We talked about the truth of the human soul. I think a lot of people were quite uh, impressed with that discussion in the sense of understanding the soul, connecting to the bodies, understanding how it all works, what's really going on inside of the soul. Um, and then we talked about the truth about reincarnation and spirits 
But, but the real crux, I feel, uh, the reason why we presented the truth about those four things first is because we wanted to get to the main point of the reason for being here, which was this truth about repentance and forgiveness. Um, because without that, it's impossible to really uh, know yourself or know God. And in addition, it's impossible to connect to God while we are in a state where we're not forgiving our brother or we're in a state where we're not sorry for anything that we have done that, have, that has harmed our brother or sister. And so we feel this information that we presented in Sao Paulo was very important to, yes. to the, yeah, and a very important part of what was presented here in Brazil. You know, if I might, what you left an impression was how to feel as a small child. I mean, to feel that all the time, mm -hmm. while at the same time making decisions that lead to joy, while being aware of your fear and processing your grief. You know, I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's like, okay, am I aware of my fear, feeling my grief, or being a baby? You know, I mean, it's, it's a challenge at times to be able to do all that. Interestingly, though, a child doesn't think of all of those things <laughs> and does every one of them. See, I already, <laughs> I've already done it with the intellectual side, right? Exactly. Oh, okay. And this is, uh, this, is a, this is where people become quite confused because the reason why they're really confused is because they still want to use their intellect to do these things concurrently rather than you see once you start embracing this childlike nature that is a part of all of us once you really embrace this childlike nature you embrace your desires and passions you embrace all of your emotions and feelings you become very honest with yourself about when you're sad when you're angry and all of you know all of those what mankind classifies as negative emotional experiences and then you also know what you desire. You, know, you, you also know, ah, oh, I really love doing that. I, that's the thing I'd love to do. And, and, you know, and, and you can feel these particular desires burning inside of you. And every time you recognize a new one, that's like your whole body and your whole being lights up. And, and this is the interesting thing I find, is that we often get asked by people who are adults, how do I put all of these three, three things together or five things exactly. together that you've talked about? And yet, when we speak with children or teenagers, it's very rare for them to ask such a question. They, they focus more their questions on, well, what are my desires and how do I find them? And, you know, those right. kind of questions where, which are... Uh, and so, really, many times the adult is expressing their fear of being able to become like a child again. Yeah, and true. And wouldn't you say that that's the majority of the work that we, we end up needing to do is just dealing emotionally with the judgments we have about what it is to be a child, about the, the fear we have of the punishment we had when we operated in that way as a child. Like all of those things I see as the, the bulk of what we have to do as adults in order to... We, we don't have to think, how am I going to feel my fear? How am I going to... Am I in grief? Or, you know, like, <laughs> how does all this work? That, right? We just have to think, why am I so afraid of just letting everything... Stop juggling, letting everything drop and just being how I am right now? And usually that's because in our childhood something happened to us when we were like that. We were told to grow up or, you know you can't be like that, that you're, that you're weak, that you're petty or you were punished for crying or whatever it was. Mm. Yeah. The hardest part about becoming, for an adult, is this process of becoming a child again in yes. the, way that we, the way that we perceive the world. We're, a child is very, very open to new truth, very open. A child doesn't automatically judge everything before it hears everything. Right. And uh, as adults, this is what we do. We judge it before we even hear it. You look at how many people did that on this trip with yes. us. You know, before they even hear it, they're already judging it before you begin. And, and this is, uh, you know, this is not a trait of a child. It's also not a trait of the child to analyse their fear. They just feel it. It's not a trait of a child to, feel, to analyse their grief. They just feel it. They, they allow themselves to feel it and then they know what it's about. And see, we as adults are so afraid to do that because we want to know what it's about before we feel it. Well, you know what began to help me was in uh, Sao Paulo where you 
were doing the uh, forgiveness and repentance, and you brought in the responsibility of the parents mm -hmm. to hold the parents responsible so that we can forgive, but we have to feel the damage that was caused to us by them. Mm -hmm. I would love to have had the time for you to continue on the Brazilian family theme and, and how they are, well, highly manipulative and controlling. And the one channeling that you did in, in Brasilia mm -hmm. with a group of mothers yes, that, right. that were in a dark space but controlling their families but they couldn't find them, yeah. I thought that was a very good way of continuing the understanding of the Brazilian family. Yes. It is a big problem that we've seen here ever since we've been here. And it is a problem in many parts of the world, this whole concept of family, where parents believe they sort of own their children and therefore have the right to dictate to their children what happens in the child's life for the rest of the child's life. And this, is a, this is, comes from a basic misunderstanding about the gift that God has given of free will. Many parents, um, instead of inculcating in their children God's principles, they just want to dominate the child with their own ideas and principles. But many, as you saw with these spirits that Mary channeled, th they didn't even know what God's principles were. They didn't even know what love was. They had never really felt love most of their life. In fact, for many of them, they'd never even felt a desire of their own for most of their life on earth. And yet they were still trying to tell their children or people like their children what to do. And that they believe that to be love. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and even more than that, I feel in families, here in families all over the world, there's this feeling that we must respect. We must respect our parents. And the, the underlying belief is that if we feel the damage that has been done to us by our parents, we're not respecting them. And I don't see that as a truth. Mm. We can certainly respect our parents, but if we are going to heal, there is this point that you raised where we have to reach a place where we can say, no, things did hurt me and I'm not responsible for them. Somebody else did that mm. and I'm responsible for getting it out of me now, that hurt, but I don't have to feel that I'm bad and shameful and horrible as, because it'll never come out of me if I take on that belief about myself. Mm. But most parents find that incredibly challenging for a child to say, you did hurt me. And they can't see that actually if a child is to really love them and respect them, they're going to have to grieve this pain that, that is in them as a result mm. of their childhood. Well, your way of describing... Mm -hmm. Children being equals to their parents rather than a hierarchy is actually developmental of, of the humility of, of being a parent rather than this totalitarian control. Mm. It's also an expression of the love of a parent because it, if a parent truly loves, they will see their own position in God's universe and their own position is just one of a brother or a sister to their own children. They are an older brother or sister and therefore hopefully know more than their own children. But in many cases we find they don't know more actually and they've become more suppressed and more damaged by society and so then they impose these damages and suppressions on their children. The reality is that for many parents they are not really their child's older brother or sister in terms of knowledge or learning and many times parents can learn far more from their child than they're, than they're able to teach to their own child and once a parent uh, realizes this inside of themselves then they have a, automatically a greater humility uh, with regard to what happens with their children and so when their child comes along as Mary mentioned and says mummy daddy you did this to me and it really hurt me and, and, it, and it really caused me a lot of damage and even right now I'm still having to do things in my life that, that, that are paying for what you did uh, in the sense that you know I'm still having to cope with the effects of what you did. The parent would then easily go into a state of repentance with the child if, if, if the parent had some humility. Unfortunately, most parents struggle with humility greatly because they don't want to feel that they were a bad parent. And so, um, and yet the reality is for most parents, uh, we've never been taught how to be a parent, so it's no wonder that we at times were a bad parent. You know, if there was some, if there was some kind of teaching on earth showing people how to be good parents and, uh, and, some kind, and, and an understanding of the soul and the emotional damage that occurs to the soul, 
then parents could be given courses in how to be parents, but uh, which would be very beneficial to them. Well, I, I would take a 10 minute course <laughs> if you have time. I mean, part of this is a very important topic because the responsibility of parents, because some parents begin to see the soul, they're listening, they're beginning to see how this works, they, mm. they believe in God, now they're beginning to accept the responsibility that maybe they have caused damage on their children. So when a parent feels this and they sincerely want to repent to their children for the damage they've caused, how can they do this? Well, I think we've got to even rewind further than that, to, to be frank. Like I feel, firstly, the parent has to analyze their own attitude towards having children in the first place. Um, you know, I feel that this is a primary issue that we need to address firstly as a parent. Did I have the child in order for the child to love me and do what I want? Mm -hmm. And to, and be to an give me a sense of purpose? Yeah, and to be an expression of Very me. Common. Or did I have the child to give the gift of my love to the child, no matter whether the child rejects that love or not? Well, why did I have the child? And, and how do I view this child? Do I view this child as a, as a brother or sister my brother or sister, from God's perspective, we are all God's children, so my own children are my brothers. I've got two sons, they are my brothers. I don't see them as my children. I see them as God's children, my brothers, and I have a, a role, because I'm older than them initially, I have this role of uh, trying to help them understand God's, uh, understand my parent, God, God, you know, God, my mother, God, my father. I'm trying to help my, my children understand God and God's laws and principles. And the best way I can do that is by having the same relationship with them as God has with me, which is one of loving unconditionally, allowing free will, but also reflecting, as God is always doing with us, reflecting the consequences of using our will out of harmony with love. Mm. Well, you and I feel that's where you need to begin. Well, it's true, but uh, honestly, what 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 is that one family in, in a thousand that has that level? If that, I would say, if, if even that, you know. So, yeah. so you're asking, where do you start? Yes, when where you go, do we start? Oh, well, uh, yes, I've blown it. Now, what do I do? Yeah. Well, what I feel is that we need to go back to these basic principles first. You know, we need to understand that we have had the incorrect viewpoint about our children. We've had this idea that our children are our children, that they are someone that we can dominate and boss around and push into doing things and manipulate and somebody who should love us. That's how we see it. You know, a lot of parents feel put your children should love you. They should respect you. They should honour you. They should, you know, there's all these shoulds placed upon the child. And, and these are the first attitudes of parents that we must address. So we need to go through and find out what, how God treats us, as Mary just pointed out, and then ask ourselves, is this how I'm treating my children? Obviously not. These are all the issues that I first must go to with regard to repentance. And to, in order to truly repent and change that, I have to find the emotional reasons, inside, the, the hurts and pains inside of myself that I'm actually avoiding through this demand on my child. And mm. that's the part where I see most parents when they hear this kind of information, they skip over that. They think, oh, I've been demanding of my children. I'll give them all free will. And then they let and their child... I won't child demand anything anymore. ...do whatever they want. And they've actually still got the injury inside of them which says, I need you to help me feel better as a person. Mm -hmm. And then they go on and, and actually create another damaging thing for the child, which is, I'm now not going to have any involvement in your life in teaching you anything about love. And, and so then the child sort of is lost. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So often, often there is this knee-jerk, as soon as a person hears the basics about divine truth, there's this knee-jerk reaction that's not about going into repentance, but it's about actually acting out of guilt. Um, so the, the parent feels guilty of what they did in the past without wanting to feel grief about what they have done, without wanting to actually go into repentance and fully own all of their unloving behaviour, and then as a result of their guilt, they often react either angrily or they completely go the other direction and just abdicate all responsibility. And God's, God doesn't do that either. God, God, so how God treats us as children is God is saying to us, always with all of God's laws, the entire universe, in fact, is geared to teaching us about love 
and the effects of unloving behaviour are clearly seen in God's universe. And, and God is constantly trying to connect with us in a loving manner allow, with our will involved, of course, because God doesn't force us to connect. God only encourages connection. And, and as parents, these are the basics we need to learn and the basic things that we need to repent about if we haven't learnt them. And as Mary just pointed out, without going into the reasons why we do it, we can't repent. We, you know, if we don't know the reason why I'm heavily invested in my son playing soccer is because I felt if I because when I was a child I wasn't allowed to go and play soccer. Then, then you know, if I can't see that relationship and he, and feel that grief and in my feel own the grief of my own, then I'm going to force my son to go and play soccer, even when he wants to be an artist and doesn't <laughs> want to play soccer. <laughs> and even when I say to him, "You don't have to play <coughs> soccer anymore, son," the feeling he'll have is, "Oh, dad, dad'd like it though if I did." And it, the emotions, as I was saying to you earlier, the emotions are what dominate our whole experience, and the words are very small in, in relation. Yeah, and I feel that most people, even we've had some luncheon interactions with people while we've been here, where, where we're trying to help them understand. These are people who have listened to the divine truth for many years, but still don't understand one basic principle. And that is, if I have a feeling inside of my heart that has yet to be removed. That's the feeling that everyone around me is reacting to, whether I say the words or not. So if my feeling is, Denny, get out of my way, and I'm nice and polite and I say, Denny, could you please move? The feeling you're feeling is not, could you please move? It's get out of my bloody way. You know, that, that's the feeling coming at you, which is a feeling of rage. Now, if you have a feeling inside of you of fear of somebody who has that level of rage, you will instantly get out of their way. Obediently. Uh, obediently, in fact. You'll willingly do it without even knowing why you're exactly. doing it. And say, what more could I do for you? Yeah, and, so and even say, what more could I do for anything you? Anything else yeah. you want to hit me with? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but if you had a feeling of resistive to a woman uh, projecting that at you, for example, um, or a man projecting at you, you had some kind of resistance, you go, no, I'm going to stay here now and stay in your way. And, you know, you'd be going to yes. this state of rebellion. And both parties wouldn't know why it's happening. And really, it's just a reflection of what's going on here emotionally between the two people in terms of their injured, unloving emotions, rather than what they're saying. They might smile at each other right. and say the nice, pretty right. words of politeness, but in the end, the emotion coming from it is completely different. And this is something that I feel most parents do not understand as well, that the emotion coming from them towards their children is what is dictating a lot of times their children's behaviour. Whether they say words completely differently or not is immaterial. How do we teach our young people to follow their passion? Well, I, I feel most young people automatically want to follow their passion. And most young people that I've met um, have much, much more strongly connected with their passions and desires than adults. They know exactly what they want to do but they're terrified that the adults are not going to agree or the adults are not going to support them while they do it. And so the, I feel the way to help the, child, the young children and the teenagers is to stop projecting our demands upon them and let them be who they are. That they already know who they are often better than we do and they already have expressed many of their desires better than we can. And I suppose for myself, reflecting on myself as a teenager, something that would have really helped me was to help me differentiate between the feelings of my parents and what they wanted or what they in their hearts had as their ideal for my life and my feelings. Because I was quite sensitive, I, I couldn't differentiate. It was all my emotional experience. And so I feel that if you are someone who's going to be working with teenagers is to help them become more aware of their emotional environment. What is inside of me and what is coming towards me? How do I feel about what's coming towards me? Should I feel obliged? Do I, what is really following? Is it disrespectful to follow my own heart? Is it, um, is it foolish to follow my own heart? You know, what is, what is the world telling me about following my heart and my desires? And what do I really feel about it? And, and teaching them about the difference between those two things. That's mm. something that would have really helped me. And also, a um, very good thing to see is that if the, if the teenagers and children can see what they're afraid of with their mothers and fathers, 
Like, I feel the main reason, if we, if we look at desire, the main suppressor of desire is fear. Fear closes down desire almost instantly. So if I am afraid of disappointing my parent, for example, as a child, I will suppress that desire which may cause disappointment to my parent. And, and so if you can help the children see their fears of their parents and see that they have no need to respond to them, they do not need to do what their parents want them to do, but they need to ask themselves the question, is what I want to do in harmony with love of myself and love of others? So, so if you can help the children take responsibility for their expression of their love and ask themselves the basic question, am I being loving? Am I being truthful? And am I being loving to myself and to others by having this desire? And if the answer to that is, yes, I am being loving, and, uh, and I don't have to sacrifice love of myself for love of others, then, then why not pursue the desire even if mum and dad are projecting anger or rage or other emotions at them? And then allow the child to see their fear of their mum and dad, the fear of, disappro of the mum and dad's disapproval, the fear of mum and dad's anger, the fear that of mum and dad not supporting them financially, the fear of not being able to live in the family home anymore because mum or dad disapproves of their, of their conduct or their action, even though their conduct and action is in harmony with love. Now, it's understandable if a parent disapproves of conduct and action that's out of harmony with love, and I can completely understand that. But a lot of times the parent's um, viewpoint of what's loving is, is the child doing what I want? Then that's loving, and that is certainly not love. That is demand and expectation being placed upon the child. And uh, I feel if the children understand these basic principles, they just fly, you know, they just, they just go through life a lot easier than most of us as adults have gone through our life. Well, you know, one of the topics that, that didn't come up that maybe we can just cover a little bit is that a lot of young people in Brazil are very much influenced by the availability of drugs because it's just porous. Mm -hmm. It's here on every level from the socially acceptable form of alcohol to the, the harder drugs that, that permeate the society and destroy many young people. I mean, how can they deal with that influence? Well, one of the main reasons that a person chooses to use drugs regularly, be they alcohol or, you know, harder drugs, if you, if you want to call them like that, they're probably all pretty hard, is because they feel oppressed by their environment. They want to escape. They want to get away from a feeling of being oppressed, being, having demands placed on them, of feeling restricted in, in their own life. And I think this very much relates to what AJ was just speaking about, mm -hmm. the, the heavy construct of family and that I must obey this family line and in order to have worth I should fulfill certain things within the family and and when a person feels that very strongly they're you know they either try to comply as with all of their being or they want to escape mm. and so I feel that the issue of drugs is not the issue of drugs it's the issue of young people feeling oppressed mm. We, we see over and over again many parents saying that their children are turning to drugs and they're very concerned. But at the same time, we see huge layers of oppression coming from the parent towards the child. And, and we, when we talk to the parent about their oppression, they will not even see it. Like they will refuse to see that they are playing any part whatsoever in what's really going on. And when a society suppress, suppresses its children, it causes the children to want to escape the oppression. And there's only a few ways to escape oppression. You know, one way is to get out, out of the family and out of the country. <laughs> well, there's one way to escape it. Another way is to emotionally escape it by reading books, watching movies, playing video games, and doing anything possible to avoid day-to-day -day interaction with the people who are oppressive. And a third thing is to take drugs or alcohol in order to escape emotionally from the pain that's being pro projected. Or the fourth way, which is what you also used a bit here, we notice, is just going out of your body every time you feel oppressed, going away from yourself and going all numb and listless and unable to do anything with your life uh, because, because you're afraid to take any action uh, because all of your actions are going to be disapproved of and you know it in advance. 
And so, you know, these main methods that people use, uh, children and teenagers and young adults use to get away from their life are all present because of society's general viewpoint towards a person embracing their will. And, uh, and, you know, of course there are also other reasons. I'm not denying that. So there are sometimes the child just wants to go out and party and ha has a selfish viewpoint of life perhaps. And, but that is also something that has been trained into them from their environment. Um, so so we've, got to, um, we've got to see the effects of us uh, trying to shut down our children and, and we've got to start examining things very differently if we want to help our children get away from the things that are damaging them. And just helping them connect again, like with their own emotional self, mm. immediately lessens the desire for the addiction, which is the drug or the, the uh, other activity that helps them avoid themselves. The more yeah. we can just help people connect with their themselves, the, the less we'll see these other societal problems. Mm. Yeah. What was your response or feeling about the Brazilian fascination with sex or sexual projection, which seems to be a, a large issue in this culture. Yes, you know, it's something you certainly do observe here. It's not unique to here, of course. It's, it, it appears to me to be in almost all cultures that we examine. But there are some degrees of openness in specific cultures to specific types of behaviour which are different. Obviously, the Brazilian wax and the, and the uh, G-string bathers came from uh, this location, so there has to be some willingness in order to, for, particularly for the woman, to display herself sexually in order to capture a male's attention. And we feel that there's quite a lot of different emotions involved in that, of course. And a lot of times, un, unusually, people would say, but a lot of times it's an emotion of fear. When we are afraid of how people see us, we then um, want to be perceived in the way that, that is going to cause us to have less fear. And so if we're afraid of uh, you know, being somebody saying that we're sexually immature or we're sexually uh, undeveloped prudish or prudish, or, yeah. and if we're afraid of that, then we will act in an overtly sexual manner in order to prove to people that we're not like that. And therefore people would say, oh, she's not like that or he's not like that. Um, and so a lot of the sexual feelings that are driven, uh, that we've noticed here, have actually been driven by fear in, in many women, allowing themselves, uh, they're very afraid of what the male may do to them, and historically so, I believe, quite afraid. And so what they do is they, uh, they allow themselves to display more of their body in a sexual way in order to capture the male's attention and have a degree of control over the male's potential behaviour. I think that also creates an addiction within women then, that they become accustomed to control through these means. And, and I feel that we've observed women around us who have that feeling also of, now I'm very sexually confident and I'm, I'm addicted to this way of having control in my life, which is to project sexual feelings and allow moreover allow people to project sexual feelings at me and then I feel like I'm in control and yeah. And remember the channeling we did in Sao Paulo too, I think it was of the woman, or oh, was it here? Brasilia. Uh, Brasilia, here, of the women, of the woman who um, was sexually, the young, woman, yes. the young woman, 25 years of age who was in the spirit world, who was using this sexual projection in order to avoid her deep grief and sadness about her life and, uh, and we feel that that is also another motivator. Obviously, sexual pleasure is something that God has given us in order to feel some levels of joy. But uh, it becomes very addictive in its nature when we're trying to avoid other emotions and we use sex to avoid emotion. And, and so we find all around the world, actually, that there is a strong desire in people to use sex as a way of, of, as a way of avoiding grief or avoiding shame or avoiding fear. Uh, it is far better to feel those emotions and release them from you completely and then you, you have the sex and love start to be connected with each other inside of you rather than having all of this uh, sexual projection that comes out of you to another. And then there's also, unfortunately, on the other side, the manipulation of the projection. You know, so, so you finish up having 
men only want to be with women who will let them have sex with them and all these kind of things. And, and instead of having any real relationship, you end up with a relationship that's driven almost totally by sex. And we've met people here who have had um, parents who have stayed together all of their life, but the only attraction has been their sexual relationship. The, the, the rest of the time they can't stand each other. And, and so, you know, this is an indication of how strong these sexual addictions are present and how big the underlying fear, shame and grief of based emotions are. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this was your first trip for both of you to Brazil. Yes, that's so right. So yeah. you've had a, um, I guess this is just only two weeks, so it feels like more. Yeah. I think it's three. It's I almost, think almost, almost three. three. By the time almost three. By the time you leave, it's almost three, yeah. right? Yeah. So what has been your real feelings and impressions of, of this country? Well, firstly, I feel that it has a huge amount of, of potential. Um, it's, a, it's a culture that generally doesn't suppress all emotion. So it's quite a flamboyant culture. And, 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 and people are able to express themselves quite freely as long as there isn't this family shutdown that seems to occur. Um, it has also a lot of potential spiritually in the sense that most people here have some understanding that God is an entity that they can connect to and have a relationship with. They, uh, they also, m most people here seem to understand there are spirits and these spirits do have some kind of an impact on their life. Of course, they don't always see that clearly, but they, they, they can at least feel, feel that. But, but to me, that forms a basis of, uh, of quite like decent change that occur. On the other hand, we see heavy spirit influence that is very negative here in Brazil, uh, both politically and, uh, and spiritually. Um, you know, there are many spirit uh, practices here in Brazil that are claimed to be of benefit to people in, on Earth, but are actually, as we observe, very damaging to people on Earth. And, uh, and so these things would need to be corrected if, if Brazil, has a, ha, as a people, have a good chance to grow towards God. So, so it's like any culture that we visit uh, around the world. Uh, we find that there are always... I'll just fix up my... Um, we find that there are always, um, uh, you know, some cultural things that are very similar in the entire culture and, and in people. Um, and one thing here in Brazil is this is this desire that everybody shares in their life. You know, this this love of everyone being involved in everybody else's life. Uh, very little space for yourself here. Here we found. And even if you try to get some private space, there's so much noise that comes from everywhere yeah. that it's difficult to not engage uh, with other people with, who are involved in that. And so we see in every culture there is similar, uh, there are sort of different things. You know, if we, in the North American cultures, it's different to here, and that's different to European cultures and even different countries in Europe, and that's very different to Australia and very different to the Asian cultures. And each culture has its own, uh, what you would classify as inherited uh, cultural uh, injuries about love. And then each culture also seems to have its own inherited, beautiful belief systems about love that they express. And uh, the key for each culture is to be able to examine this openly and honestly and discuss it. And rather than seeing it as a cultural issue, seeing it as an issue of love. And uh, we feel that if if uh, that occurred here in Brazil, then Brazil has much, very positive prospects for the future. We see, though, that there are some very dark, uh, negative, uh, politically based and spiritually based spirits who are attempting to have Brazil become a world-dominating power in the future. And these particular spirits are quite unloving in their behaviour towards a lot of people here in Brazil. And a lot of people here in Brazil are in addictions with them. They want the power. They want the, the feelings that these spirits give them. And so we see a very strong codependency between the spirits and the people that are out of harmony with love. And this is something that we feel will be the major impediment to, to, for Brazil to grow in harmony with love in the future. Mm -hmm. Mary, any feelings that you have about Brazil? Uh, I probably agree with a lot of what AJ said. I, I've really enjoyed our visit 
very much mm. and just we've met some really beautiful people and uh, I think that it's lovely to know you, Denny, and know your friends who are really mm. beautiful people and, um, yeah, I feel... One of the interesting things for me has been that many people are quite open to mediumship here mm. and it's shown me a lot about myself also in that I've felt more open to mediumship here which shows me that a lot of my um, reservation around mediumship has still to do with how other people around me view it. So when we're in Australia, there's still a lot of um, cynicism, I suppose, and doubt around mediumship, and I find I'm more reserved there when I'm channeling. So mm. that's been... That's, I always find that everywhere we go, there's so many gifts in terms of seeing myself... Uh, I used to travel a lot and try to see everyone else and the culture and become very engrossed with the culture. And uh, now I, I try to um, be myself within the culture and see what the culture shows me about myself. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for me, I suppose the biggest issue that I've faced since I've been here is the amount of spirit attack I've been under, as, as you know. And uh, um, obviously I've still got some emotions I need to work through to address this issue of, uh, of my openness to their attack. Um, and as you know, it can get some, quite unpleasant as you've personally experienced since we've been here. Um, and so, you know, for me, I need to look more directly at the amount of uh, spirits that are attempting to harm me and, and, and what I can do inside of myself emotionally to prevent this from occurring in the future. Mm. Well, you know, it's um, quite an experience when you begin to comprehend that when you're channeling, you might be channeling for a group of thousands or you're encountering groups of millions. In the audience, we have you know, just a few, 10 or 15, but there's an audience of millions, yeah. and some of them really would rather that you not be here. Yes, and right. majority of them actually. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, when we have a small group that's very oppressed by those particular spirits, as you've seen, um, even the group finds it difficult to even ask one single question because they get so shut down by these groups of spirits uh, when they come along. And unfortunately, they then judge that as something to do with me. You know, so instead of seeing it as me being under attack, they see it as me carrying around a group of dark spirits, and that must mean that I'm dark. They don't understand that the brighter the person on Earth, the more attack the person is going to become under from the spirit world, and, the, and particularly from the darker spirits in the spirit world. And so they don't see this underlying relationship. And this is where I feel many people on earth don't understand really what's going on. They expect to go along to a person who's telling them the truth, and particularly to a person who's claiming to be Jesus. They expect to go along and have a, have a pretty, lovely, beautiful experience instead of coming along to be confronted, <laughs> challenged, and then also uh, to experience a, a large number, generally a large number of spirits who are also challenged and confronted, um, they they then feel that that is not that is an indication that I am not who I'm claiming. Of course, uh, our spirit friends in the spirit world know that, uh, and I know that these things are happening to me because of the truth that we deliver, not not in spite of it. And we also know, uh, Mary and myself know, how many spirits there are in the spirit world. There are literally like tens of billions of spirits in the spirit world, earthbound who are completely unwilling to, to want any more truth to be delivered to the earth. And the main reason why is they, they have their addictions met through the connections they have with people. And so, as you saw in, this, in the group, even just here in Brasilia, there are some people who f felt the influence of those spirits and yet came back the next day and then could see that they were being trying, there were spirits trying to push them away to have them not be there. And this is where we were attempting to help people understand here in Brazil that not all spirits are benevolent, but rather many of them are malicious and have personal interests at stake. And in fact, this is what we find in many of the discussions we have, that there are so many personal interests at stake for the spirits that the people themselves are not even letting... Are, are not, the spirits don't even want to let the person on earth hear what's, what the truth is. And you've had that experience, haven't you, even before we came, how you start telling people on earth the truth 
and the spirits with them just want to shut them down completely. They walk away. Yeah. And so the person on earth walks away not understanding that the influence that they're under by these spirits is so great that their entire life now has been affected by not listening to a truth they could have heard just because of, of this negative spirit influence. What can we do? I mean, uh, honestly, I've at times lost friends under this spirit influence, people I care about. I mean, yeah. honestly, I care about them. They, oh, I don't get it, I don't see it, and they criticize it and walk away. I mean, yeah. Yeah. What, what can we do? Well, we've had exactly the same experience, as you know. We've lost many friends that we believe and we still feel are our friends, but there's people who feel quite upset or angry or, or indifferent to us now. And the reason why is because they do not understand how much spirit influence they are under in the majority of cases to reject the truth. The reality is, is there is little you can do about it. Um, the person themselves needs to see their own addiction with these spirits. What are they getting from the spirits that causes them to want to listen to these spirits rather than listen to the truth? What are they getting? And usually what they're getting is some nice feelings, some feelings that they're in power or they have control of their life or you know, belief systems that are supportive of their life's goals. You know, they're not being confronted in any way. Uh, they're being, you know, and this is all. This is all to do with the addictions of the individual to not be confronted, to not know more truth, to to remain ignorant. And there's little you can do for a person who's in that zone, uh, unless if they want to stay in that zone. You, you need to just love them, let them leave, and then at some point in the future when they want to come back, let them come back and and listen to more perhaps. But but it takes a lot of time for people to recognise they are under influence and also then to do something about that influence. And doing something about the influence is, as we discussed, all about looking at the addictions that we have, emotion, in particular the emotional addictions that we have. And uh, it's very important for us to, to see the emotional addictions we have and then do something about them. Yeah, I'm always surprised when um, people sort of and I, I suppose maybe I had that idea in the beginning as well, but when people seem to feel that spiritual involvement, spiritual progression is not going to be confronting. But I, I look at the world around us and I think it, there's a lot of evidence at hand now that as a human race, we are not very evolved spiritually. Mm. There are people starving, we're murdering people. Well, could we we're say it more directly that we are not, invo we are not evolved in love? In love, yeah, which, which is, is I suppose, spiritual. what I view yeah. as spirituality. Yeah. And so when I look at the world around me and I recognise that my soul's powerful, it's a part of creating what's there, it's telling me that I'm going to have to confront quite a few things inside mm. of myself, quite a few errors, and that's not necessarily going to be a smooth process. If it was smooth, we would have already done it. <laughs> but there's a mm. lot of investment we have in holding on to errors and injury. We're so invested that we're willing to let people starve and we're willing for people to live in huge conditions of injustice and we're willing to manufacture guns in order to to hold on to these injuries inside of us. And so it's going to be confrontational and, and I, I see that as a matter of course. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have created the world that we have. And, um, yeah, I'm surprised often when people feel that... I see a lot of people engaged in so-called spiritual pursuits which make them feel good all the time. And, yeah, I, mm. I don't see that, yeah, how we can avoid being confronted. Yeah. And when, when we were in the first century, you know, everybody was confronted. If you have a look at the Bible record, you can see that all of the, you know, political, all the politicians of the day, all the religious leaders of the day, and most of the people were confronted. You know, the rich people were confronted, the poor people were confronted, the, the sinners, were, the so-called sinners were confronted, the so-called people who believed themselves to be without sin were confronted. Everybody was confronted by the truth. And that's the way it should be. Because in the end, if we all knew the truth right now, as Mary said, we would all be living in a perfectly loving environment right now. The reality is none of us are living in a perfectly loving environment right now. And this tells us that all of us are out of harmony with truth at some point. And we need to allow ourselves to be confronted by that. 
And, and we can't expect Jesus to come along and give us a nice heap, a heap of love, <laughs> lovely feelings just to make us all feel good about ourselves oh. without having some kind of level of confrontation of what is unloving within ourselves. Well, you know, the confrontation may be, it's August 2012. Mm. We may all soon be confronted with who we are. So how do you see earth changes relative to Brazil or in the greater picture, helping us to find out who we really are? Well, as all events occur, I, I, I don't see earth changes as being a trigger to us finding out who we are, unfortunately. I see earth changes as just the direct result of our own unloving treatment of this planet. And, um, and as a result, we will feel the effects of that unloving treatment. Like a global law of compensation. In a way, yes, it is like a global law of compensation. The reality is that if we were all loving at the moment, we would all survive any coming changes that are happening on the planet. So there is no danger per se, from any changes that would occur on the planet if we were all in a loving space. The reality is our unloving behaviour towards this planet is causing already huge amounts of problems on the planet, as, as you're well aware. And, you know, the, the big issue that I feel uh, we need to ask ourselves is, are we willing to change no matter what the earth does. Like, if the earth didn't change at all, would we still be willing to change? Because that's what it's going to require at the end. We, it's going to re require that each individual on this planet decides to take personal action to become more loving. That's how this earth will change and become more loving. It's not going to change and become more loving just because some physical change occurs on the planet. It's going to change and become more loving by people choosing to become more loving and and they can choose to do that without anything happening to the earth if they want like that's the reality so so i feel the issue of earth change is while you know i can answer the questions of what i believe was going to happen currently in brazil and bear in mind that you know to analyze the effects of what's happening in brazil with earth changes is going to be analyzing the effect of you know, 30 billion people and their response to divine love and, and I'm not certainly not in a space at this point to do that accurately. But what I believe is that the majority of Brazil will survive earth changes. It is perfectly positioned on the planet and in terms of its own topography to survive aside from many of the coastal regions. So I don't believe that many of the coastal regions here in Brazil will have a very good survivability. But the, the interiors of Brazil, you know, above the 700 metre line and in, in, inland a couple of hundred kilometres from the coast, was probably going to have quite a good degree of survivability. The issue you face here is what's going to happen afterwards. Like what kind of anarchy may be present afterwards and what kind of, you know, unloving behaviour is going to be present afterwards. You have very many large cities, like when we first saw Sao Paulo, we were just, you know, astounded at how big that city is in it terms is of size and it's the biggest city I have, I have ever seen in my physical life here on earth and um, it, it you know, far exceeds cities such as New York and other cities that I have seen in terms of size and, um, and it's just immensely populated you know, with, with, you know, and you can see the, that it's growing so rapidly that it's eating up the cities that are two or three million are surrounding it as well. It's like right. it's just every single year it appears that it's just another three million or four million people because of the size growing, it's eating up another city, another city, another right. city, and it's just growing and it's just a huge city. And if you imagine that huge city without water, without food, without any uh, way of distributing water and food to the po populace in the city, there no, you know, very little uh, energy available in the city. Um, you can see that within a few days of any such event, it would be tremendously big proportion of problems in that city. And this is the issue we feel people face in Brazil and everywhere where there's high populations, is that unless the population itself is loving, it's very, very hard. Uh, the, the main problem is not what's going to happen during earth changes if they occur. 
but rather the problem of what's going to happen in the cities that right. survive afterwards and, uh, and how mankind treats each other once yeah. the events occur. And so this is where I see the main problem for Brazil and also most other nations, to be honest, um, and particularly nations where, where there is a big, heavy city-based population uh, where they're very reliant on government uh, resources or government uh, facilities to survive. Well, you know, Brazil is not really built for earthquakes because it's never had any. Mm -hmm. So the building codes are quite lax. So when the continent begins to move and the seismic activity comes through, the probability is that all services just stop and would not easily be replaced for a number of years. Yeah, Brazil has some unique things though, doesn't it? It's got, uh, it's got the interior is quite high. It's a beautiful climate and, and that's probably going to mm -hmm. remain so. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, you do not need to build these big, thick, solid wall buildings that right. seem to happen here. Um, you, could, you could potentially live in a hut uh, in Brazil and, and be quite happy because, uh, you know, I know in the wet it, m it must get pretty wet, but um, there is a, um, yeah, just a beautiful climate here, summer and winter. So, so there is also a lot of water. You also have a lot of natural production of electricity through you know, hydroelectric schemes and so forth. And so in that way, Brazil is quite unique. Of course, some of these things may break or fail, um, but uh, a lot of the resources may be retained. So this is why Spirits chose Brasilia as a, as a location for the centre of government here in Brazil. It is going to be a very safe location. And it's also why darker spirits are choosing Brasilia as a way to manipulate uh, people spiritually and politically. Um, because it, they believe it's going to be a survivable location with a lot of people that they can manipulate. So it's just, in the end, going to get back down to that one particular thing, which is, do, do, does each individual want to bring their soul into harmony with love, or are they going to still act out of harmony with love and act in their fear and their anger and their rage? Now, to me, that's the main question. The question of Earth Changes is, to me, uh, almost a non-question non in a lot of ways. The main question is going to be, are the people who are living on Earth right now going to choose love over everything else? What is their priority system? And I feel that unless some of us choose love over everything else, other people won't see uh, uh, an, uh, an example of a person who chooses love over everything else. And if not, other people don't see the example, then how can they ever hope to do make, make the same choice? So this is where I feel that the people who do listen to the truth, if they can choose love over everything else, then there are a lot of very, very positive things that can happen here in Brazil. However, if they choose fear, and rage and other emotions over everything else, then there's going to be a lot of very negative things happening here in Brazil. And to be frank, the same thing could be said of every country of the world. Mm. So how does uh, divine truth continue to progress when you leave? Well, that is going to depend a lot on um, how each person who has heard the truth here responds to it. Um, you know, as you know, we don't control how people respond to truth. We just, we just deliver it and then move on. <laughs> and uh, we are not responsible for how people react to our teachings. We, we feel all of our teachings are loving in nature and if people react badly then that is their choice to react. We do not treat other people badly ourselves, myself and Mary. And, and we would, would expect that anybody who's following the teachings that we give would also not treat other people badly. But uh, it depends a lot on the individual, how much they're willing to justify their own behaviour, how much they're willing to desire their addictions to be met, how much they're willing to work positively on their desires in harmony with love. We would like to encourage every person who listens to our message to work on two primary things work on the issue of repentance and forgiveness. That's number one. So in other words, look at all the things they need to forgive. And more importantly for most, because most are more ignorant of it, look at all the things they need to personally repent about or what they've done to other people. 
The second issue that we feel people need to focus on is their desire. They need to recognise their pure desires, the real passions that they have in their soul, and pray about those passions and recognise them, and then do them no matter what anybody around them thinks of it. You know, do them because they want to do them. Make sure the desire is in harmony love, and let God refine the desire, but, but follow that. And if they do those two particular things, the first they're going to need to do with God, the second they're going to need to also do with God if they're going to need to be truthful about it. But, but if they could do those two things, a lot of people here in Brazil will benefit from the fact that we now have 20 or 30 hours of presentations that have been translated into Portuguese. And, uh, and while they're a bit stilted to listen to because of the translating process, um, it's going to be very beneficial, we believe, for people if they embrace the principles that have been taught. And I feel, Denny, if you can help people with this quality of humility, which, as you know, is the gateway to truth, which is the gateway to God and love, um, that would help so much. You know, it's that by you stepping into humility, under, having your own journey with what is humility, how do I become a humble person, and sharing that with others, if you indeed are in Brazil, or anyone who is in Brazil, if, if they can uh, model that themselves, that just becomes teaching in itself. And, yeah, I just feel that that would help so many people. And we, we would love, of course, to see somebody want to set up some kind of a learning centre about divine truth. But it's going to require, honestly, just sharing more and more of the truth with as many people who are able, and to not remain fixated on sharing the truth with people who are already of a spiritual mind. We need to share the truth with people of all walks of life. And in fact, myself and Mary often believe that it's the people who believe themselves to be spiritual who are actually some of the hardest people to share the truth with because they already have a very, very strong opinion of their own spirituality and a very strong opinion that they already believe themselves to be love when the reality is often that they are very unloving and very, and very resistive to new truth. And they have become like a religion in many of the cases, a religion who's not willing to, ex to listen to more truth and then to work through the issues of, of working out whether they want to believe that truth or not. Um, you know, they're like a religion with a dogma and they only want to accept the dogma and, uh, and we feel that here in Brazil, the way to connect to many people here in Brazil, there are many people who I would classify as grassroots, real, raw people. Who, who, these are the kinds of people that appeal to myself and Mary the most. The people who are down to earth, real, raw, honest. They say exactly what they feel. They tell you exactly what they're thinking. You can interact with them. You can uh, enjoy their company, you can see their personality, you can see their desires being expressed. And we feel that there are many of those people here in Brazil who, who are able to listen to the message of love, which is what the message is that we're delivering, who are not interested in spirituality because they see the hypocrisy of it, they see the illogical behaviour many times of that. And so we feel the key is to just find, you know, express the desire in your soul to find those people and whenever there's the opportunity, deliver the truth to them. Also, we see for yourself there's this opportunity with regard to the medical profession here of understanding more about the spiritual influences upon the medical profession, both from spirits who are trying to lead them into doing things that are, uh, uh, that are uh, not allopathic but rather, you know, more holistic type of medicine, um, but also the spirits that influence the, the profession to, to avoid the soul, you know, to get away from the true healing that occurs in the soul. And we feel these two particular areas here in Brazil are just ripe for presentation. Um, and there are so many people here. Just in comparison to us where we live in Australia, obviously there's ten times the amount of people in the same kind of space. Right. And, um, and, yeah, there's just so much opportunity here to share truth. Uh, but, but obviously it's going to require people who firstly want to embrace it themselves to do that. So we're hopeful that because of these resources that are available now in, Portuguese, in the Portuguese language, um, that, that 
you know, many people will hear the truth as a result of it. And then some of those people hopefully will want to follow it. And uh, when they do, we feel that there will be a great amount of growth here uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of people wanting to become more in harmony with love and sincerely embracing that desire. Yeah. Would you say that, Dale? Like, so like, there's so much potential, but there's also so much negative potential here, it feels. It's sort of like a mixed Very potential. Mixed. Yeah. yeah, I would agree, absolutely. Yeah, mm. and I, I feel like it's... It's not by accident, Denny, that you have found yourself in Brazil and while he no while here you found out about us and you had this experience where you felt like I wanna teach this he and you did that here and um mm. I feel that there's a reason there and, and now because you did that we've come here and and because of that Adriana had the chance to translate into Portuguese and I think it's just as AJ always says beautifully, it's sowing seeds without any expectation about what happens and mm. let's just, uh, all three of us have this pure desire for people, no matter who they are and where they are, mm. to know God and to connect to God and so three of us together with that desire, there'll be something come from it, we mm. just don't know what. Yeah. And there so, are many Brazilians here who have a similar desire aren't they, yes. that we've met, so yes, you know, we are. see many of the people we met with a strong, pure desire just to share, give the gift of their love. Mm. And we feel, yeah, if you, there will be many opportunities come up as a result of these people to just share the truth with others and just let the seeds fall where they may and let them grow and just try to support the growth as much as possible. But, but the reality is we are not responsible for the growth of the truth in another person. They are personally responsible for the growth of that truth they are the only ones that can develop their own relationship with God and they are the only ones that can help their soul develop in love and happiness. And so, you know, we, all we can do is provide the material and provide the truth and provide the tools, but, but uh, we can't do much more than that. It has to be driven by a sincere desire in the individual to change before the individual will want to change. Yeah. Is there something that we can do in your absence to feel your presence here? Or do we wait until you learn to teleport? <laughs> <laughs> or will you be coming back physically? Well, obviously, um, the time differential between here and Australia is such that when we are asleep, we get the chance to visit people who are here in Brazil and in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, in other parts of the world as well. And so we often, you know, come to people during our sleep state and, and spend time with them, you know, trying to help them through specific things that they're going through. And we, you know, we obviously would like to come back again, but that's going to be very dependent on other events that occur and also other interests that occurs around the world. As you know, we're just two people. We, we uh, you know, we, we don't have the ability to be omnipresent as God does, uh, and therefore we don't have the ability to be with every person at the same time every time and uh, and this is where people need to learn that it's all about their relationship with God and not about their relationship with myself and Mary that matters if people develop that relationship then there is always a large potential for growth if people try to develop their relationship with myself and Mary without developing their relationship with God then in the end I will find that they won't have a very strong relationship with myself and Mary nor with God. And, uh, and so what we'd like to do is encourage people in our absence to focus their attention on their relationship with God and, and continue to do that whether we are present or absent uh, because that, we feel, is the main point of the reason why we've visited Brazil or any other location on the planet. Yeah. Well, it's certainly been a rich experience. Yeah, we've enjoyed getting to know you too. You know, it's, it's been quite the experience to feel both of you and watch your impact on people and the diversity of things that you present and, and how people respond. It's uh, quite a treasure to know these, these things are possible. And it's interesting too how some groups are really enjoyable to be present at and other groups yeah. are very difficult to be present at. <laughs> we've had a completely diverse experience here, yeah. haven't we? Yes. Well, thank you for coming, and we'll see you when we see you again. 
And we'd like to thank you too for expressing your desire for having us come, but also your desire to know the truth and share it with others because that is one thing that really drew us to you was this underlying desire that you have that's very pure in you of wanting to share the truth with others even if there is some personal cost to that sharing. And there has been, hasn't there, Denny? There has. Oh, yes. There's been personal cost and it's been painful. Yeah. I felt like that the um, experience of you when I first viewed the original video was almost like a a key opening a, a lock in my heart that opened yeah. because the truth was so easily present. It was so alive. It was <clears throat> fresh. You know, sometimes my feeling of humility is um, that it's dynamic and alive. It's not submissive. It's just your way of being with the truth was dynamic and alive. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. liberating rather than in any form controlling. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's my experience of you and I'll see what comes next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking forward to seeing what happens for, for you in your own personal life, but also we're looking forward to seeing what happens to other people we've met here. You know, we see that you have some, there's some very beautiful people that we've met while we've been here. And we feel that if they embrace the principles of love and truth and connect with God directly, they're going to they're going to have immensely beautiful lives ahead of them, and and we're just looking forward to seeing the development of that. Yeah. And for each of our friends that came along, the the personal time that we had, where you put your microscope right down inside their soul and described what they knew to be true about their personal habits or addictions or relationship to mother and father and soulmate or yeah. whatever yeah. was so revealing yes. that they have, uh, they have lots of things to process for quite some time. Yes. I don't need to look at the eye to see the soul. <laughs> <laughs> this is right. I, I, I recognize that you don't really need the iris. You can just sit there and you have it, right? Yeah. I like that. And the reality is that capacity exists in all people. Right. Once they are completely open to God and completely open to their own emotions, they will also have that same level of sensitivity to the other person. So the beauty of that is you won't need to look at the eye to know the person. Exactly. You will feel the person and know the person. Lots of practice. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so much practice, I feel. It's more, it's more a state of releasing inside of yourself the resistance mm -hmm. to it, and then it happens automatically. It's not, it's, not a, it's not something that you need to practice. It's just you become more and more aware of these abilities as you release different mm -hmm. things. Yeah. But it's been lovely talking with you again, Indeed. Jenny. Yeah. And hopefully many of the people who are in our audience will enjoy this private discussion as well that we've had that you intend to translate into Portuguese yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. So thanks for that. Thank you, Denny. Yeah. And right. thank you for hosting us and arranging so mm. many of the things that have happened for us on this trip. It's been wonderful. Like yeah. the wonderful lunch that's coming up. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. We've, e we've vegan eaten amazing. so well. <laughs> we have eaten trip. well here. Yeah, Very fancy well. finding a vegan restaurant in oh. Brasilia. Well, and in Sao Paulo <laughs> we had Sao Paulo, amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the um, we might uh, do one more channeling that we will record ready mm -hmm. for you to take with you as well. We just feel that uh, if, if we get the time to do that before we leave and yeah. before we, we leave you with our disk drives, and, and, but but if, if we don't, we wish everybody who's watching these presentations and also this interview the, the best in terms of following the path and, and connecting with their relationship with God. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.